Thank you, John, um, and welcome, and thank you all for supporting wildlife conservation. So if you were to ask me 40 years ago what I would be doing, I would say I'd be in Africa. And I grew up there, I was born there, and I was going to go back and study the leopard. But something happened on the way. I got my degree at UC Berkeley, and I decided <laughs> on the way back to Africa, I really wanted to see some mountains, because there are no mountains in Zimbabwe, or very few. And I went to the Himalayas, and I ended up in the most remote part of Nepal, I think. Uh, and I wanted to go on Sherpas. You know, I heard about Sherpas. I went on a trek. Where did I go? To a snow leopard area. And I saw that snow leopards were obviously very shy. I never saw one. But people were hunting them because they were a threat to their livelihood. And I said, well, you know, Africa has plenty of researchers. Maybe I should go back uh, and I should look for money and study snow leopards. So f a few years later, I was lucky enough to win the Rolex Award for Enterprise, which, of course, made all this possible. And this cat, I don't often see it, as John indicates. Maybe in my 40 years, I've probably seen it 45 or 50 times, but not much more than that. It's incredibly elusive, but boy, does it capture you. And this is my expedition way back in 1980s, early 80s. Snow leopards have never been dis studied before, and we picked, I think, a great study site in far western Nepal. We got money from National Geographic, so we were able to put the first radio collars on snow leopards and track them in a study that became a seminal study, really, for 20 years. It was the cover story, much to my delight and amazement, really, in 1986. And it really brought attention to this rare cat that people have heard about that was endangered. But of course, the threats are always there. And they're still there. Back in those days, the big threat was fur coats being traded for a fur coat like that, $60,000 in Europe. It was fashionable to wear them. Nowadays, you can move ahead on the, on the right there. You can see the snow leopard pelt. Well, those bones are very valuable for East Asian medicinal purposes, so they find their way there. So cats do have a lot of threats. One of the big challenges is that they live in such a vast area. Twelve nations of Central Asia, you can see in this image, it's taken at night. So it's a satellite picture. All those white spots are city lights or town lights. And the most amazing thing, of course, is that snow leopards are in some of the least populated parts of the world, which really helps a cat, because that way the number of threats are a little more constrained. The people that live them are mostly pastoralists, and but we can deal with that. However, we do have a challenge that a lot of these countries, as you can look at this range in the orange area, you can see it's often along border areas. So one of the critical things we have to do is to work between nations, across nations, which is not an easy thing to do. The other problem with snow leopards is that they live in really high mountain area. So I work anywhere from 10,000 feet to 16 or 17. In Mongolia, they go down to about seven, I guess. But you're always in steep country. The steeper it is, the, the happier the cats are, somehow. And after we did our study, my first 10 years or so of, of my career, actually, and this is back, I, I'm in my mid-30s, going on early 40s, was spent on training local people, local rangers, how to survey this elusive animal that nobody ever saw through two techniques in Bhutan, in Nepal, in Mongolia, Pakistan, and critical rangers. Rangers of national park people, because that's really where the core snow leopard areas were. However, I realized very quickly that parks people didn't always have the resources to go out at the front line with the local communities, as you can see here. Now, this is a mass killing. This is a major mur murder sequence, I guess, where a snow leopard got into a livestock pen at night, killed the entire holdings of a family, their sheep and their goats, which is like their bank account being wiped out. Somebody broke into the bank and took all your money. Naturally, they look at snow leopards as a, an incredible pest. So how do we change this? And this is 
the rest of my life, and I find, I think, my career, the really the most satisfying part was working with local communities, with the individual herders like this guy, Tashi Langel, and his family, and by simply putting up a predator-proof corral, wire mesh over the roof, as you can see there, strengthen the stone wall. You can stop the snow leopard from getting into the pen at night when they're usually out hunting, and you stop this catastrophic loss. And immediately, the local community are far more willing to see and to coexist with snow leopards. They see them actually as assets if we take the big next step. And the big next step really is how do you prove the income uh, opportunities for these mountain people. So the average income probably in snow leopard range, and this would be in rural areas, is around four to six hundred dollars a year. And if we can bring in another uh, five hundred, a thousand dollars, you've really got a win-win situation because now the family can send their kid to the good schools. And there are no schools, as you can imagine, in these remote areas. But they can go to the local town and get educated and have a good future. And with that has come a real change in snowpers. Instead of being secretive, where you never see them, I see them once a year or something like that, now I can go to a, a particular reserve like Hemis, and in, oh, seven days, I can see them four or five times, sometimes from 50 yards away. So this is a dramatic change, and I really put this down to the local people. Well, there's a cat watching us. This is taken with a cell phone, believe it or not. <laughs> so it's really, and not taken by me, but by one of the tourists that come out and look for snow leopards and was very lucky to get close because this cat was on a kill. But this brings me to the next stage of my career. So 40 years helping study them and protect them, I realized that the real legacy, the critical challenge in this world today is handing over to the next generation. These kids, this is an international snow leopard day in Russia, in the Altai Republic, and you know we are showing them their traditional animal, their keystone animal that lives in the mountains that they never see, few people ever see, because it's shy, because it's been poached or hunted. We want them to be the next generation. And so I am really appreciative for WCN because they've enabled me to work on this cat, to work with the communities, and now through the network that has been developed here to train and engage the next uh, series of conservationists. And as this cat walks away from us, um, I really want to make sure it has a, a good, strong future. And the best future is with some of the young people that I met. And it, I'm very delightful delighted to be able to introduce one of our latest, Rinzen uh, Wanchuk Lama, Punchuk Lama. He got his scholarship from WCN. Thank you, WCN, for that. He studied his degree in, in Germany, and now he's back in Nepal three months, and he's been working. So please help me welcome Rinzen. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rodney, for the brief intro. Can I, help it? Help I feel back. really great to be here. No, 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 no. I'll just go back. I first saw a snow leopard when I was 17. I was walking down a gully, a valley, and then like next to the cliff, I saw a snow leopard. Basically, I didn't know those were snow leopard. I saw two big cats, and then I was so scared. I pick up the rock. But I didn't throw at them, trust me. <laughs> I threw it on the bush and it's like shouted very loudly just to scare them away. That was the first time I saw a snow leopard. And like it really fascinated me. It really surprised me that, you know, and now I'm a snow leopard biologist focusing my career for his conservation the rest of my life. So I was born in an indigenous Buddhist community called Ninba. So Ninba literally means sunny valley. In a, in a, in a western, in the western Nepal, in the district of Humla. So Humla is the most remote part in Nepal, like virtually roadless, still not connected to the main national highway. So this is the village where I was born, grown up, and attended a, like a local school. 
So when I was starting in grade six, so the civil war in Nepal, led by the Communist Party of Maoists, was at its peak. So like every parent, my parents thought that it may not be very safe for me to be in the village. So they sent me to Kathmandu, the capital city of Nepal, like for the further study. So like this is the typical dress that our Ninba women wear. So after graduating from the school, I returned back to my hometown. And that was the first time that I encountered with the snow leopard. So during the time, you know, I, I had chance to meet herders, interact, and then I like, learn about the snow leopard and other wildlife. And that was the, like, the most important movement that really pushed me into the wildlife field. And then after, after that, I returned back to Kathmandu, and then like, because I already knew that I wanted to be a conservationist. So I joined Institute of Forestry, because forestry was only the program in Nepal that trained the conservationists. So I completed it well, and like, you know, like in, in the science in Basel, like we had to do a project work. So, but I didn't do my project work on snow leopard somehow, but I ended up starting this little tiny here, pika, is one of the snow leopard's favorite snack. So after graduating from the Institute of Forestry, Pokhara, so I returned back to my hometown again to do a first ever camera trapping survey of the snow leopard. So which ended up recording snow leopard in the region for the first time ever. So this was the picture we recorded during that time. And coincidentally, the picture was captured on like July 28, which was my birthday. <laughs> so that was a big surprise. So during the survey, like, we visited to hoarders, we recorded the livestock, you know, like we, we, were, we wanted to study how the conflict was. So we interviewed hoarders about the livestock loss, and then we found there is a serious conflict, and there was no measure like, taken to reduce the conflict. And then somewhere in my mind, I thought, okay, I should be doing something. I didn't promise anyone, but I had a feeling that, okay, I should do something. So this is the yak, the symbol of Highland Livestock Husbandry. It's the most like valuable livestock the people have in the highland of Nepal. So one of the reasons I found like the snow leopard frequently predating upon the livestock was, you know, like the livestock and the snow leopard spray, blue sheep, like they often use the same area for grazing. So like when they graze together, the livestock were always easy to kill by snow leopard. The other important reason was the herders. They live up in the mountain with the snow leopard are poor herders. They can afford to build a predator-proof corral, or they, like, they don't find the materials easily to build those corral. So that is one of, like, one of the reasons the snow leopard jumps into the corral and kill livestock. So in the picture, you can see a herder's camp with a very poorly fenced corral. As Dr. Rodney like, mentioned, so the situation is even more severe in case of the small stock, like goat and sheep. The snow leopard would jump into the corral and kill each of everyone until there is no movement. So that is the most difficult situation, which often like, results in retaliatory killing of the snow leopard. That is why reducing conflict is one of the most important things in reducing the threat to snow leopard. So we have been like, we have been doing lots of activities, I would say, like, you know, integrated approach to conservation. That is what I like to call integrated approach to conservation. So, the, like, the key thing we are focusing on is on the herders' education, because, like, uh, they are the ones who spend most of the time with the snow leopard, so they need to be educated about the importance of the snow leopard, the potential they can bring to the community through tourism. The second is, you know, re helping them reduce the livestock depredation. So this in the picture is the fox light with the horror's background. So this is the fox light, you know, like a, it's a flashing light. It, it has a automatic like a solar charge system. So it throws high rays, like rays in the mountain. You know, as soon as it gets night, in the nighttime, it throws the rays in different color. So up in the mountain where there are no settlement, like when the snow leopard sees such unusual lighting, they get a feeling, you know, they get a feeling of human presence or like you know, they just get scared of this light and they stop coming close to the livestock corral. So this is what like the hoarders have the biggest weapon, not to kill the snow leopard, but to push the snow leopard away. Yeah. 
The second thing we are supporting is the predator-proof coral. Actually, like between the pole, there is an iron mesh, actually. So to the most vulnerable herders, the poor and those, those who live in the most vulnerable, like vulnerable to the snow leopard habitat, which are more prone to get attacked by snow leopard. So we have been supporting this predator-proof coral. The one of the, like, this is a very good measure, actually. You know, it, it, it makes 100% protection of the livestock at nighttime, but the cost of construction is a little bit more with this. The third thing we are focusing is the educating the school children, because like, uh, like they are the future of the society. So we have been focusing lots of program on school children to increase their interest in the field of wildlife conservation. So to promote them as a future conservationist and who can lead the conservation work in their community. So in the picture, my colleague Tashi Argali is demonstrating the camera trap handling to the school children. So this is the picture of the school children participating in celebrating the International Snow Leopard Day. So in addition to these activities, like we believe not only fo just focusing on the people or the community or the herders living in the snow leopard range would help to protect the species. We also believe that like the awareness should spread among the general public so that the people in a like, bigger number knows about the snow leopard. So that is why like we have been running a radio program in Nepal. So perhaps the biggest ever radio program focusing on the snow leopard conservation awareness in Nepal. So in the picture, I'm handing the radio, shortwave radio to the herders to listen so that they can listen to our radio program, listen to the news, what is happening in the country, and like they can produce some noise in the herder set. So it might help to push, deter the snow leopard. So apart from these conservation activities, we believe like the research is one of the like strong foundation in building the effective conservation measures. So like we, we, we do a lot of livestock depletion studies. So what are the ecological factors that is really pushing snow leopard to kill livestock? Or like we also study about the snow leopard population, the prey status, and then like the habitat status. So in the picture, like I'm, inter I'm interviewing herders about livestock loss. So this is inside the tent made out of the yak wool. So as you are, as you might be aware, you know, winter is the best time to see snow leopard. But this is the most difficult time in the mountain that we get big snowfall. So we climb up several hours to get to the camera trap site to clean up the snow so that the camera works properly and keeps capturing the snow leopard. And the other thing we do is like spending lots of time scanning through the binoculars, the sporting scope, to looking for the snow leopard. But hardly we could see any. So it's not that easy. Sometimes like we see us. Most of the time, we don't see it. And we also use the spotting scope to count snow leopard spray blue sheep. Now, like, I'm going to take you to my project site. <laughs> Hold your breath for a while. It's, it's really thrilling. <laughs> so this is the road to my project site, Manang Valley. The quality is not very good because I filmed it from my mobile phone. So this is from my recent trip to my field. So as a snow leopard lives above 10,000 feet in the mountain, like the, like the terrain they live, the climate they live is really extreme. So one of the most common problem or the common challenge that we feel while starting a snow leopard is the logistic. Logistic is one of the most like difficult thing. When we are in a high elevation survey, so we often have to carry all the food, like equipment, by ourselves. The other problem we encounter is the weather. In the mountain, the weather gets changes so quick. So it's sunny in the morning, and it might get snow in the afternoon. So that is what we have to deal with most of the time. So I'm going to share a small story on this. So it was in mid-October 2016 when like, we were doing a camera trapping survey. We're on our way back to our camp around like 5 p.m. in the afternoon. And then like we're crossing through a ridge at the elevation of 17,000 feet. And then like slowly the fog started covering the area. And we keep on walking and after a few minutes, like it's all covered. We lost our visibility. We could hardly see like 30 feet in front of us. We keep on walking, we keep on walking. 
and we ended up in a very tall cliff. There is no way out. So we relaxed, we took a deep breath, and then like we returned back. We decided, and I and my other two colleagues, we were together, and we decided to go back what, the way we come. By the time it was already dark, it started snowing, but we keep on walking. We keep on walking, and then luckily, we found a landslide area. And we were familiar to this landslide area, and then we relaxed. And we knew that the landslide would lead us to the stream, and through the stream, we could get to the campsite. So three of us sit together, and we, dis like, we decided, okay, let's slide down through the landslide. And then following the landslide for like 40 minutes, we got to the stream, and then slowly, we got to the camp at 10 p.m. In the, at night, wet and weak body. So this is something we often deal with in the mountain while it's starting with snow leopard. It's, it's the, like the terrain because of the terrain. Regardless of all these challenges, the difficulties that we come through, there are big movements or there are good movements to celebrate. The most important movement is when the snow leopard passes by one of our camera traps and leaves a selfie. <laughs> or the one when we see one live in the field, like this. So this is, this is the photograph my colleague Tasiar Gale captured in our project site, Manang Valley. So you can see how well they are camouflaged with the environment. So he was also recently awarded with the Disney Conservation Hero Award. This some more picture. So this is the snow leopard robbing, and then sand marking. This is one of the common <laughs> behavior of the snow leopard they do to, to mark their territory. <laughs> Can you hear the sound? Yeah, this is called yelling, because snow leopard doesn't roar like a lion or tiger. So in the winter, like from February to late March, that is the mating time of the snow leopard. So in the picture, like the female snow leopard is calling his male for the hangout, dating, you know, like to hang out. <laughs> you, you understand what I mean? <laughs> so this, these are some more pictures from our camera trap. The same more picture. So this is at the elevation of, I think, around 18,000 feet. So while it's starting a snow leopard, like we get you know, like all the achievement also. So this is a picture of the Himalayan wolf we photograph in our project site. So the wolf was abundant in the valley before. That is like based on our study, we found that wolf were abundant, but like they were killed and completely like gone from the valley because of the livestock predation. So that is one of the things like we worry, I worry about which, which might happen with the snow leopard. So in the last 10 years, I had a chance to visit almost every snow leopard range in Nepal, throughout the whole snow leopard range in Nepal. I met hundreds of herders. I interact with them. And then I, went, I witnessed anger, frustration, those who lose livestock. And I also witnessed love, passion, those who really believe that this species should be protected. This elusive cat shouldn't go extinct. And the most important, I also met the herders who are really willing to participate in a bigger conservation campaign, given the help that, you know, in, if we help them reduce livestock loss and help build alternative sources of income opportunities. So from my recent trip to the field, like I recall a sage from the herders on the use of the fox light in their words. Like after the use of this light, the snow leopard attack on the livestock at nighttime has gone down. So this has not only helped us reduce the livestock loss, but help us sleep better. So the changes are possible. You know, together we can make the change. With your support, our engagement, engaging the local community, hoarders, scientists, students, everybody, we can create a better future for Snow Leopard and the fragile mountain ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you.